It is a story any journalist would die for. I remember my hands were shaking. It was looking more and more every day like he had been killed. A tenacious reporter uncovers an intriguing tale of love, greed, and deadly betrayal. It was like a spider waiting to catch the prey. There was no question we had a black widow who draws her victims into her web, and then she poisons them. A police officer struck down in the prime of his life. He started getting sick with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. He said, man, I'm so sick to my stomach, I'm about to die. It would be a pretty painful, agonizing death. And the gruesome mystery deepens. The only thing that kept me going was the second death. While authorities try to unearth the truth, Digging up a body that's been buried that long is a major decision. That was just like a stab in the chest. It was devastating. They are running out of time. I just wanted to take things in my own hands. Can an intrepid reporter help catch the elusive killer? She put two and two together and it came out four. Now we're talking murder. It's early evening on March 2nd when Linda Thomas gets a welcome call. I said, uh, how's it going? Are you feeling better? Linda's brother, Glenn Turner, has been suffering from flu-like symptoms for days. His blood pressure was up. He was dehydrated. And he said, had a really bad stomach ache. He said, one of those stomach aches where you just feel like you're going to die. A turn of phrase that will turn out to be true. Marietta, Georgia, a historic community a stone's throw from the bustling city of Atlanta. And home to Glenn Turner, who as brothers go is about as good as they get. He was actually one year younger than me. We were always together. We played together. We partied together. We were very, very close. He was a good older brother. He tried to keep me in the right direction. <laughs> I'd, um, at times, wanted to stray, and uh, he was always there to um, keep me right. And like many young men, Glenn Turner had a passion for bikes. I had pictures of him uh, with this motorcycle with the neighborhood kids. At the age of 23, Glenn turned his pastime into full-time as a motorcycle officer with the Cobb County, Georgia Police Department. I remember Glenn the first day that I met him at the precinct. I was kind of nervous. I was a brand new rookie, and Glenn was in the squad room, and we got to talking, and he was just, I was like, man, this guy's, he's cool. We ended up being friends ever since then. He was just, uh, as a lot of his friends would describe him, a big teddy bear. And the strapping 29-year-old is a hit with the girls. Glenn had a party. I mean, there would always be lots of women. He may not be dating them, but he was friends with them. 22-year-old 911 operator Lynn Womack is one of those young women. She had long, dark hair. She was slender. She wore, you know, nice makeup. She was a good-looking girl. She wasn't um, a drop-dead beauty in the face, but she had a uh, really, really nice body. After years of swimming solo, Glenn Turner is hooked. Lynn had her act together. She knew exactly what she wanted, and Glenn probably needed that a little bit. Two years into their relationship, Glenn pops the question. And on August 21st, Glenn and Lynn tie the knot at the Marietta Baptist Church. Glenn loved her. I mean, he was definitely in love with her and, and looked up to her and had her on a pedestal, I mean, at, at, to start with. Over the next year and a half, the newlyweds share Lynn's Marietta home. But Glenn Turner is a lot less happy than he'd hoped. Before he married her, he was going out after work. He would go bowling, we'd go to a bar. And then when he got engaged to Lynn and started seeing Lynn seriously, that all ended. Glenn's single life is a thing of the past. And married life isn't all it was cracked up to be. He grows increasingly unhappy and his friends can't help but notice. I said, what's wrong? He goes, me and Lynn. He said, you know, pretty much I made a bad mistake. I want to go back and have fun again. And in late February, the couple decide to call it quits. He'd already made arrangements to move in with his dad. They were going to sell the house. 
and he's gonna be there another week. Given the stress of the breakup, it's little surprise that Glenn comes down with a bug. Glenn had called in sick three days in a row, and it sounded like he had the worst case of flu or stomach virus you could have. I'm like, man, don't come to work if you're sick. And I thought, well, you know, the poor guy, he's tired, he's exhausted, his immune system is run down, and that he'll be better once he goes to the doctor. But by afternoon of the third day, Glenn feels so bad he heads to the hospital. He said, man, I'm so sick to my stomach, I'm about to die. He said, I'm just shaking. I don't know what to do. I'm hurting that bad. I called him that night, and I said, uh, how's it going? Are you feeling better? He said, well, yeah. He said, I went to the hospital, and they gave me some medication for nausea. So I'm like, well, you know what? I'm glad you're feeling better. I'll hear from you tomorrow. Hopefully, everything's going good. It is the last conversation with Glenn his family will ever have. Later that day, Mike Archer hears from one of Glenn's many friends. She called me and said, uh, are you sitting down? I said, what's going on? She said, uh, uh, I hate to tell you this, but they found Glenn Turner dead in his bed this afternoon. The 31-year-old struck down in the prime of his life. Glenn's sister is just returning home from dinner when she gets the horrifying news. We walk into the house and the phone started ringing. And it was um, Mike Archer on the phone, and my whole world fell apart. And I knew he was depressed, and I knew he was upset that the marriage didn't work. So I thought maybe he's sick and his immune system dropped, and this flu just got the best of him and, you know, killed him. Glenn's mom gets a call from a distressed family friend. And the first thing he says, Kathy, I've got bad news. I said, what's that? And he said, Glenn's dead. And I thought to myself, no, Glenn's not dead. Lynn Turner tells the attending officers that the night before his death, Glenn was so sick he'd been hallucinating. She said he went downstairs to try to drink something out of a container that looked like gasoline. He thought he could fly off the porch. You know, she was a 911 operator, so she calmed him down and she put him to bed. Lynn tells Linda that Glenn was much better the following day, so she went out to run some errands. She said she returned, and she found him in bed, dead. She was upset. I'm writing down what she's telling me because I'm such, such a wreck, but yet I have to pass on the information. Glenn's mother comforts Lynn as best she can. I feel sorry for her. You know, you've lost a young husband, and you're young yourself. And on June 3rd, three days after his tragic death, Glenn Turner is buried at the Cheatham Hill Memorial Park on the outskirts of Marietta. It was amazing. It was amazing. Every traffic light or stop sign I came to, there was an officer who would stand there and salute. Jane Hansen is a newspaper reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. One of the things that interested me about this story was how tight a community that is. They're there because he was one of their own. He was an officer down, and they came because they were concerned about him and their 911 operator, his wife, Lynn. It was tough on a lot of guys that worked with him. And it was, it was tough seeing his family, the, the sorrow that his family was going through, because I knew that they weren't going to get him back. Cobb County police officer Glenn Turner is dead. The 31-year-old's body was found in his Marietta, Georgia home. He leaves behind his young wife, Lynn Turner. Glenn's family is stunned by his unexpected death. He had been sick for a few days with flu-like symptoms, and then he's dead the next morning. How is it that such a healthy young man could die so suddenly? Was Glenn's death as natural as it seems? The Turners hope his autopsy results will provide some answers and perhaps some peace. The family questioned what was going on to the medical examiner's office, and we were promised that everything would be looked into because he was one of theirs. And they came back and said everything checked out. It was natural causes. The autopsy showed that Glenn had an enlarged heart, 
and the cause of death was cardiac dysrhythmia, which is simply an irregular heart rate. Glenn's mother struggles to come to terms with her eldest son's death. Well, I have a lot of faith in God, and I knew that he was dead, and there was nothing I could do to bring him back. I just had to learn to accept it. A 45-minute drive from Marietta lies the former mining community of Cumming and Lynn Turner's hometown. The widow moved here after Glenn's death, looking for a much-needed fresh start, and she found it. She has a new job as secretary with the district attorney's office and a new man. The handsome 25-year-old Randy Thompson, a sheriff's deputy, about to realize his childhood dream of becoming a professional firefighter. When he was young, there was just a volunteer fire department there in Forsyth County where we lived, and he just was always interested. And so when he was old enough, he and my dad both became volunteer fire department members, and he loved it. He also loves the new woman in his life, and she seems smitten by him. She took him to races, Lynn took him on cruises. Whatever she thought he may want to do, she would do it for him. For the single dad struggling to make ends meet, the attention is just what Randy Thompson needs. He loved it. I mean, like any single person would, you know. He's got this cute girl that's showered him with gifts and trips and everything else, so why not enjoy it? Randy soon moves in with Lynn Turner, and before long, she's pregnant with their first child. So he bought her a ring, planned to marry her, and do the right thing. But the couple hit a rough patch, living beyond their means and getting deeper into debt. And then the fighting kind of started. You know, they would break up, they would get back together, just off and on, off and on. And with his relationship with Lynn in trouble and behind on support payments to his ex-wife, Randy turns to alcohol for solace. Then in February, he attempts suicide. Well, he, he took some pills and then he called my dad <laughs> and said, Dad, I did something stupid. I took these pills and I know I shouldn't have done it. My opinion is that if you're really trying to kill yourself, you don't call someone for help. <laughs> Randy recovers, and the following year, he and Lynn, who's now working for a judge, have their second child. But even that's not enough to keep the star-crossed couple together. I remember talking to him on the phone, and him telling me that he had gone to church, and that he had given his life to the Lord, and that he was changing some things. Including his relationship with Lynn, Randy decides to leave the children with Lynn and moves into an apartment. If Randy and Lynn could have gotten along, then he would have loved to have had that family for them. I think that Randy kept going back to Lynn because of the children. He wanted to be in their life more than anything. And on one evening in January, Randy joins Lynn and the kids at Longhorn's Restaurant on the outskirts of Cumming. A day later, Randy starts getting sick, vomiting, diarrhea, and an excruciating headache. Just thought maybe he had the stomach flu or something. You know, we all did. But his symptoms worsen. Later that day, Randy is so ill, he goes to the hospital. And they gave him fluids, released him. I knew he was sick, but obviously we didn't know how serious it was. The following afternoon, Brandy McNeil gets a strange phone call at work from her husband. He said, I'm, I'm gonna come get you. And I, we, we had just gotten a little dog, and I thought something had happened to the little dog. And he said, no, I just need to come get you. I remember feeling, this is weird, you know, and I got in his truck, and he said, I can't even say it, He's, he died. And it was, it was horrible. The 32-year-old firefighter had died painfully and alone, leaving behind Lynn, three young children, and his heartbroken parents. My mother was just, could not be consoled. You know, my dad was out on the road. He was driving a truck at the time. And I mean, when, when he got there, he and my mom and my sister Kimberly and I just held each other and just were devastated. Forsyth County firefighter Randy Thompson is dead. 
the 32-year-old's body was found in his coming Georgia apartment. He leaves behind his common-law wife, Lynn Turner, and three young children. Randy's family is stunned by his sudden death. His friends and co-workers are determined to honor him. There were a ton of fire trucks, all types of emergency vehicles there at the funeral home. And then when we got to the cemetery, they had two ladder trucks that had their ladders up to a point that they took my brother's body under. You know, it was very special. His autopsy reveals that like Lynn Turner's husband, Glenn, who died six years earlier, Randy's death was also found to be the result of natural causes. He had an enlarged heart, irregular heartbeat, and that's what he died from. News of Randy's death eventually makes its way to the Turner family. It was just very devastating to, to, to know that this has happened a second time. Here I thought I was through grieving. I'd already handled Glenn's death. And then to hear about another one, Randy Thompson, that was very devastating. And too much of a coincidence for some members of the Turner family. This is another guy in his early 30s, very much in good health, and now he's dead. So there is a common denominator. Lynn, Lynn is a connection between the two men. Some of Glenn Turner's friends are also suspicious. When I heard Randy had died, I mean, the hair went up on the back of my neck. And my first instinct told me Lynn had done something to him. Though he hasn't a shred of proof, Archer contacts a fellow Forsyth police officer. I explained him the whole story. I said, I have strong suspicion Lynn did something to Glenn. I have strong suspicion he did something to Randy. Uh, he assured me they were going to look into it. They're going to get right on it. Investigative journalist Jane Hansen is already looking into it. The award-winning Atlanta reporter had received a tip that double deaths might be a story worth pursuing. I'm immediately thinking, is there some coincidence here? Is it true? Where are these people? Who are these people? To find out, Hansen will need to talk to the families of the dead men, starting with Kathy Turner, Glenn's mother. I called Kathy and arranged to meet with her at the Big Chicken, which is a well-known place north of Atlanta in Marietta. And she brought her son, James Turner, with her. And we took the autopsy report that we had and all the information we had on the case and, and shared it all with her. They tell Hansen that despite the conclusion that Glenn Turner died from an irregular heartbeat, the family now fears Glenn was murdered and that his wife, Lynn, may have had a hand in it. The reporter is skeptical. Is this sour grapes? You know, are they, what's the motive behind their talking to me? And where is the proof Glenn's death was anything other than a natural one? I'm assuming that the medical examiner knew exactly what he was doing and did, in fact, find what he said he found, which was an enlarged heart, and that Glenn had died exactly the way the autopsy said he had died, by an irregular heartbeat. That would not be the first person who died that way. Jane was very clear with us when we first met with her that from listening to what we had to say, to looking at the documents, that she really didn't feel like there was anything there. And she told me, she says, Kathy, I think it's going to be a closed case. We're not going to get anywhere. And I said, all I can say, Jane, is in God's hands. I don't know anything else that we can do. So I told them, I'll give you my word that I will do the best I can to find out what happened. But I don't know that I'll ever be able to write a story about this. And the reason is that it's been marked a natural death. And who am I to say it isn't? In the days following, Jane Hansen lives up to her promise to the Turners by tracking down some of Glenn's friends, including Mike Archer. And she said, I hear you're kind of suspicious of uh, the death of Glenn Turner and Randy Thompson. I said, absolutely. I began to explain the whole story from Glenn from start to finish and the situation with Randy. And uh, Jane said, uh, well, let me see what I can do. Let me dig into some things, and I'll get back with you. She reviews the two men's autopsy reports. I was familiar with autopsies. I had done other investigative stories in which I had looked at quite a number of autopsies, so I knew what they showed and what I could find out from them. Hansen is intrigued by what she finds in Thompson's report. Randy had nausea and vomiting and headache. I learned that he'd been treated at a hospital with intravenous fluids. 
And then the most amazing thing to me was the cause and manner of, of death were identical. Is it likely that both men had enlarged hearts and both had died as a result of cardiac dysrhythmia? The reporter goes looking for a second opinion. I took the autopsies to a friend who is a cardiologist, and he did look at them, and he said, it sounds like an, you know, they had cardiac dysrhythmia. But Hansen's journalistic instinct tells her to talk to the Thompsons anyway. So I called the lawyer of the family to find out, would the family talk to me? The answer is no. We were trying to just deal with the fact that Randy was gone. So at that point, I have two natural deaths and uh, one family's interview. I had no story, none. Disappointed, she files away her research. This was something I thought was worth pursuing, but I didn't know if I'd ever be able to go into print with it. Weeks later, Hansen gets an unexpected phone call one that will set in motion the news story of a lifetime. Newspaper reporter Jane Hansen is convinced she's onto a great story. She has compared the autopsy of deceased police officer Glenn Turner to that of recently buried firefighter Randy Thompson, and she is startled by what she sees. Those autopsy results were indeed a red flag for me because of the similarities. Both men were young and healthy, both had suffered severe flu-like symptoms before they died. Autopsies in both cases reveal an enlarged heart. It definitely represented to me, wow, this is pretty doggone similar. But when a cardiologist tells Hansen that it appears both men had suffered a natural death, and when Randy's family decides not to speak with her, Hansen has come to a dead end. I knew if I didn't have something about this second death, I didn't have a story. She reluctantly shelves her research and moves on to other stories. Less than a month later. I got a call out of the blue from this lawyer reminding me who he was, that he had been the Thompson's lawyer and they were willing to talk to me. Could it be the break in the story Jane Hansen needs? Early the next day, she makes the two hour drive south from Atlanta to Warner Robins, the home of Randy Thompson's family. Unlike my interview with Kathy and James Turner, um, this interview was a lot more emotional. It, it was still only a month or two since he had died. And Randy's mother, Nita Thompson, she was extremely emotional. Jane asks them about Randy's death. They talked about the days leading up and he had gone to the hospital and had intravenous fluids. And I just felt it was sort of a deja vu. Uh, I felt I was listening to the same story. Not only was Randy's death identical to Glenn's, his life with Lynn was similar too. We told Jane that Lynn was very controlling. She would walk into a room and wanted to be the center of attention. She was unemotional um, about my brother's death. She would not go in to see him. She just had a very flippant attitude at the funeral and at the cemetery. And that's what the Turner family had described also about Lynn at Glenn's funeral. And then after he died, she cut them off. She didn't want to have a relationship with them. I mean, it was the same. You know, everything was the same. I went back to the newsroom and said, wow, they even used some of the same words to describe Lynn. These families had never met one another. They had never talked to one another. But that is about to change. My son James took me down there, and Nita comes out to me, and we had never met each other before, and we hugged and hugged, and here we were, two mothers, grieving over our lost sons. It was a very hard day. When we met with the Thompson family and started comparing all the dates and times, we were able to positively identify that while Glenn and Lynn were married, that Lynn was dating Randy. She had told them that she was divorced from her first husband. So they never questioned that. But now both families are questioning whether Lynn Turner killed Glenn in order to move in with Randy. Like any good reporter, Jane Hansen is hedging her bets. People have affairs, and um, it doesn't mean they're murderers. Was she perfect? By no means. It said to me she was living a double life. It was pretty extreme, but it didn't mean she was a murderer. 
I absolutely had zero hope that she was not involved. I didn't know to what degree. I didn't know if maybe she had someone else do something. I just knew 100% it was her. So if Glenn and Randy were murdered, how? I was researching this, that, and the other. Again, I still didn't have a story, so I had to do this kind of on the fly, and I just kept looking into what it could be. Hansen begins to wonder whether Glenn and Randy had died of poisoning, and if so, what kind and how to prove it. You can't just go and say, would you screen for poisons, please? There are hundreds of poisons. So you have to know which one you want to screen for. If you don't know that, you're not going to find it. She turns for help to a forensic toxicologist at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And I said, what would cause these symptoms? What kind of poison or some chemical? I didn't know. What could cause this? And he gave me many different kinds of things that it could be. But Hansen's gut instinct tells her that the deadly substance could well be ethylene glycol, the main ingredient in antifreeze. Ethylene glycol is sweet and odorless. It doesn't take a lot to be lethal. And of course, the symptoms, if you don't know again what you're looking for, you're not going to think ethylene glycol. You're going to think they're sick to their stomach. They've got a virus, you know, horrible virus. But in order to run with the story, she'll need someone to confirm her theory. Will the toxicologist reveal what he knows? I said to him, could you tell me off the record, are you looking at ethylene glycol? And he responded, off the record, yes. And I remember, I, and in fact, I even wrote it in my notes, am I smart or what? I smiled and I remember thinking, bam, I got it. By now, the authorities are feeling Hansen's heat. For the friends and family of Randy and Glenn, it's about time. Really nothing was being done. Jane began to make phone calls. Jane began to speak with the investigators that were handling the case. Jane began to speak to the GBI. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation pulls Randy's autopsy report to get a closer look at what the pathologist found two months earlier. He noticed in the kidney slides uh, calcium oxalate crystals, which is indicative of ethylene glycol ingestion. And so he asked the toxicology section to test for that since they normally don't do that. And the toxicologist did do the test, but made a mathematical error. Uh, he was off a decimal point. So while the toxicologist was puzzled that Randy Thompson's tissues contained any ethylene glycol, 38 milligrams per liter was hardly lethal. But if the amount was actually 380 milligrams, it was more than enough to kill him. I wasn't surprised. Uh, I was amazed. Uh, you know, errors do happen, but none like this. The GBI rushes to test Randy's tissue samples again. The new results confirm everyone's worst fears. The firefighter had died as a result of ethylene glycol poisoning. Then they change his manner of death from natural to a homicide. Now we're talking murder. Reporter Jane Hansen's dogged questioning has caused the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to doubt the results of Randy Thompson's autopsy. The initial test concluded that Randy had died of natural causes, but when authorities retest his tissue samples, they discover the firefighter had consumed a lethal amount of ethylene glycol, the main ingredient in antifreeze. That was a real big moment in the case. Things started to really happen fast, and I wrote one story, and pretty soon I was writing a story a day. Each day, it seemed as if something was happening with the case. I was in contact with Jane almost daily. My job was pretty much confirming what she found out for the record. I wasn't necessarily releasing information to her. She had already uncovered it through her sources and was calling me to try to confirm it for the record. Given Randy's startling test results, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation decides to take another look at the death of Lynn Turner's first husband, police officer Glenn Turner. They retrieve his kidney slide from years earlier and retest it, this time looking specifically for evidence of ethylene glycol. And as soon as they put the polarized light on it, the kidneys lit up like a Christmas tree. And so they knew that there was a connection to ethylene glycol poisoning there. At that point, the district attorney of Cobb County decided they were going to exhume 
Glenn's body. The exhumation of Glenn Turner's body after six years it is a major decision. It implicates the government intrusion by digging up a body that's been buried that long, especially a police officer who died. It implicates uh, families. I handled his death OK, I thought. But that was just like a stab in the chest. And I told Jane Hansen, I said, have him do it while I'm gone. On a scorching day in July, with Glenn's mother out of town, the authorities prepared to unearth Glenn's remains. I stayed in my vehicle on the hill and oversaw the exhumation, but I didn't want to be down there, but I wanted to be present. It was scary because we knew that we were going to get an answer, and I don't think that I was really ready for it. Six years after he was laid to rest, will Glenn's body reveal its terrible secret? The result of the exhumation and the testing of Ben Turner's organs, it was found that he also died from ethylene glycol. Glenn's family is devastated by the horrific news. You don't want to face that someone could do something like that to your son. We know that Randy died of the same thing. So now we have two young men, both died of the same death, both died alone, both died with flu symptoms. I think everybody in the back of their minds knew there was only one connection between the two men. Both were involved with one lady, Lynn Turner. Everything, everything pointed to her. Within a short period, both deaths independently were ruled as homicides. Glenn's manner of death was changed from natural to homicide, and uh, Randy's was as well. With Lynn Turner, the number one suspect in both men's deaths, the authorities want to speak with her. Hello? All right, Lynn? Yes. This is Cobb County Police. Yes, sir. Listen, I was wondering if uh, we could get together and uh, maybe for an interview regarding this case that I'm working here. Um, all you'll need to do is call Mr. Banks and set it up. I'll be glad to give you his number. OK. All right, well, I'll see if I can call him and set it up. and. Uh, Try to work something out here. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's no wonder Lynn Turner seems unfazed by the phone call. The prosecution has little hard evidence against her. We don't have fingerprints. We don't have DNA. We had no witnesses, no admission by her. And that's just the beginning. She worked for the sheriff. She worked for the DA. She worked for the judge. I mean, who would believe that she would be murdering a police officer? The body of police officer Glenn Turner has been exhumed. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation has determined that like victim Randy Thompson, Turner had also ingested a deadly amount of ethylene glycol, the main ingredient in antifreeze. It just basically shuts down your kidneys and you die. And it'll be a very agonizing death. And though authorities have no real evidence against Lynn Turner in the death of either man, there was no question in our mind we had a black widow who murdered both her husband and six years later, her boyfriend. So we knew we were going to have two trials. But which trial to proceed with first? That decision could well determine whether Lynn Turner is found guilty of the murders or walks free. The strategy would be to go with the Cobb County case of Glenn Turner first. Why are you going for this old death when you have a new death? fresh death, where you still have tissue samples and good forensic evidence. Because it was a better case. Glenn was a police officer, and everybody loved him. And so he would come across that way. He had less baggage, a straight arrow cop. Randy wasn't as clean in terms of his background. Randy, you know, drank and had some personal problems of his own with the the attempt at suicide. And we didn't have issues like that in the case where Glenn Turner was murdered. And if Lynn Turner is convicted of killing Glenn, it's likely she'll also be found guilty of murdering Randy. They would use the Cobb County case of Glenn Turner to show her modus operandi because the circumstances were the same in both cases. And on November 1st, Lynn Turner is led in shackles into the Cobb County Courthouse. In the case of the state of Georgia versus Julia Lynn Womack Turner. To everyone's surprise, Turner is granted bail. Did you kill Lynn, your husband? Do you still maintain your innocence? 
Do you have anything to say at all? Murderer! Lynn, you say you're... Lynn, people are calling you a murderer. Is that true? How in the world can our justice system let her go out and do what she wants to do when we've been held and in captivity in our emotions for all these years and she's still walking the streets? But whether it's outside or inside the courtroom, Lynn Turner seems convinced she'll be found innocent. It is an attitude that enrages the Turner family and the Thompsons who've come to lend their support. Lynn sat in the courthouse making little funny, smiley faces at her lawyers and going back and forth with them and seemed like she was at a ball game. That was her mentality that, that she couldn't be caught, that she was untouchable. And that's why it was so important for me to be there. Over the months following, prosecutor Jack Mallard paints Lynn Turner as the only one with the means, opportunity, and motive to kill Glenn Turner. The means, of course, was her signature weapon, and that was antifreeze. There was a can of antifreeze in the basement of their house. I knew the opportunity in Glenn's case. Lynn Turner lived with Glenn Turner at the time of his death. And the motive was fairly simple. She wanted to be rid of Glenn because she was already having an affair with Randy. And for a woman deeply in debt, Glenn's death was a windfall. She was beneficiary of Glenn, of her husband's insurance of a total of around $150,000. Also, he had retirement, which she drew after his death. But according to a profiler involved in the case, Lynn Turner's motives are more complicated than that. He told me she was a classic sociopath. He described a sociopath as somebody who always wants the attention and always wants to be in control. They can be smart, they lack emotion. He also told me that he did not believe Lynn was just in it for the money. She killed because she also was losing control of the relationship in each case, that she didn't want to be left. The prosecution describes how Lynn mixed antifreeze with the very foods that are a comfort to the sick. She made him jello. We know that. You can pour antifreeze into jello and you won't notice it because it's odorless, tasteless. But the most damning evidence to emerge from the trial is the conversation Lynn Turner had with a female employee of a local animal shelter. Lynn asked about what they use for euthanizing animals. And I remember this young woman, she said, I don't know, we call it the purple stuff. And the young woman said to Lynn, no, it's not a substance that we can give out. So I think that was a prelude to her deciding to use antifreeze. The trial will last more than 10 months and attract media attention from around the world. It is a journalistic marathon for Jane Hansen. She worked with the prosecutors. She spent the days in court with us. She wanted to help us get the final answer as to what had really happened. I wrote story after story during this trial. And in one of the stories, I alluded to the fact that Lynn rarely expressed emotion. And the next day, she came up to me and said, you know, everybody says I don't express emotion. And she said, I just don't want them to think they got the better of me. In the early afternoon of May 15th, the seven-man, five-woman jury begins its deliberations. The jury had been out, and Lynn came by. And I said to her, whatever happens today, whatever the jury comes back with, and she cut me off and said, I'm going to be acquitted. She was very confident that they were going to find her not guilty. Lynn hasn't long to wait. The jury returns that evening with their decision. Murder suspect Lynn Turner is on trial for the fatal poisoning of her husband, 31-year-old police officer Glenn Turner. Although the case against her is largely circumstantial, prosecutors hope they have convinced the 12-member jury that the 35-year-old Turner was the only one with the motive, opportunity, and means to kill Glenn. No other person on earth uh, had that same position. At 7.34 p.m., after less than five hours of deliberation, the jury returns with a verdict. We were all holding hands and just hugging each other with our arms around each other. I was nervous. 
Uh, but I also had to cover this story, so I was in full work mode. And they came in, and he asked the foreman to read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Julia Lynn Womack Turner, guilty of malice murder. It's almost like I lost my breath. I had tears streaming down my face, and I'm like, oh, wow, like, she really did do this. And the most telltale sign, I think, was Lynn very calmly taking one earring out and taking the other earring out as if you can't get the best of me. Lynn Turner receives an automatic sentence of life in prison with no chance of parole for 14 years. There was no reaction to her punishment. There was no reaction to the guilty charge. She was very non-emotional. Nearly three years after she was found guilty of poisoning Glenn, Lynn Turner goes on trial for the murder of Randy Thompson on March 13th. The jury must decide not only her guilt, but also whether Lynn Turner should face the death penalty. I was so afraid they were gonna sentence her to death. And I really, really didn't want that. There was still a part of me thinking, what if she really isn't guilty? And I didn't want to think that somehow I might have been responsible for sending a person to her death. The jury finds Lynn guilty of Randy's murder, but spares her death by lethal injection. She will serve the rest of her life in prison with no chance of parole. Maybe she planned it from the beginning. She knew that if she had the children, he would have the insurance policies, and eventually she thought that she would have a lot of money. I would hate to think that anyone is that evil, but she did what she did. The justice system worked. I think Glenn would be thankful. He'd be thankful to Jane Hansen for being the one who really pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and put all the pieces of the puzzle together. My job was to tell the story and to tell it fairly and accurately. That's what I was focused on doing. I really wanted to find the truth. Hansen left her job with the newspaper to join the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, but Jane kept in touch with Lynn Turner by mail. Then Lynn's letters stopped coming. And on a summer day, Jane Hansen receives a call from GBI's John Bankhead. He said, uh, Jane, are you sitting down? and he told me that they had just found Lynn dead in the uh, prison, and I was dumbfounded. She died of a uh, drug overdose, and she had a number of medications she uh, was prescribed in the prison system. What she apparently did was hoard the medications over a period of time and then took them all at once. It didn't surprise me. She had life without parole waiting on her. She didn't see any future, so she took her own life. And you, you live by poison, you die by poison. 